Jude verse 1, the servant of Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3 said, I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation. That's what I want to talk today about is common salvation and how common salvation is uncommon in a land full of apostasy, in a land full of doctrines of devils in a land full of false converts and false brethren in a land full of people that have turned the grace of God into lasciviousness and so I think about common salvation and I think about that scripture right there and what common salvation is The three things that come to mind when it comes to common salvation are a testimony, holiness, and with holiness, the grace of God. Because the Apostle Peter said, you know, I write and exhort and testify that this is the true grace of God wherein we stand. The scripture says in Titus chapter number 2 and verse 11, For the grace of God which bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying all, all ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So the grace of God has appeared unto all men. And the scripture says in First Timothy chapter number 2 it's the will of God that all men would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth scripture says in Acts 17 and verse 30 that God commands all men everywhere to repent it says in 2 Corinthians 5 that for the love of Christ constraineth us for we thus judge that if one died for all then all were dead and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him who died for you and rose again the scripture says that he died for our sins and not only our sins but the sins of the whole world um, so the grace of God is for all it's available for all uh, God's not willing that any would perish that but that all would come to repentance and so that's God's will for man is that they would come to repentance, that they would repent and be converted. And through that, the saint, because that's what happens when you become converted, you become a saint in this common salvation that's uncommon in a wicked, ungodly world. What happens is in this common salvation, there's a testimony testimony revelation 12 and verse 11 says that they overcame him or you know the enemy by the blood of the land it's talking about the devil in that uh context by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto death 
Revelation 12 and verse 11. I'm going to say it again. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sins. Uh, it says in Revelation 1, Revelation 1, verse, I think it's 2, might be 2, sorry, it's verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So the blood of the lamb cleanses us from all sin. It washes us from our sin. As he says there in 1 Peter, uh, chapter number 1 and verse 2, elect according to God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So that blood of Jesus Christ is part of how we overcome, but it's the word of our testimony. And so an uncommon denominator in common salvation I'm sorry an uncommon denominator today is that there's no testimony with most people in common salvation there must be a clear testimony and most people don't have a clear testimony or even have a testimony uh, they don't have an experience as you see as thus saith the Lord in the scripture they don't have a testimony like the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter number 9 now we know that he came the Lord came to him on the road to Damascus most people know that part he was knocked off his horse and there was a light that shined round about him most people know that part but they don't what you see here in the Apostle Paul is somebody who gets born again and immediately begins to start serving the Lord. You know, there's no tarrying here with Paul or anything like that. It's a salvation and he's immediately serving the Lord. And it's, and it's like... Uh, you know, all throughout the Gospels, when Jesus would heal people, you know, one of the first things that they would do is they would go publish it, especially in the Gospels of Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark. It talks a lot about when Jesus would heal people and immediately they would go start publishing what happened to them. They would give a testimony. And so that's what happens to the true believer. They are not ashamed who, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Okay, and the context of that in Romans chapter number 10 is salvation. For whosoever, that's anyone, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But nonetheless, you see here in the Apostle Paul, Acts chapter number 9 and verse 17 and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on the on him said brother Saul the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost and immediately there fell from him his eyes as it been scales and he received sight for with and arose and was baptized and when he received meat he was strengthened then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached in preached Christ in the synagogues that he was the Son of God. And if you go down into verse 27, uh, it says, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus and he was with them going in or sorry coming in and going out of Jerusalem he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians but they went about to slay him okay immediately 
He gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And what does he do? He goes and he preaches. He goes and he preaches. And then he preaches about this. His testimony. He preaches about it. Talks about it. Before a multitude. gives his account here of Jesus it starts in verse 6 and it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me and I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me Saul Saul why persecutest thou me and I answered who art thou Lord and he said unto me I am Jesus of Nazareth whom thou persecutest they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake unto me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there shall be told of thee all the things which are appointed for thee. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. One Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked upon, up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see the just one, and shouldest hear the voice out of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So he repented and believed right there. He obviously did exactly what Ananias told him to do. And in that other account there in chapter number 9, he received the Holy Ghost. And we know what happened after that, as we have the Acts 9 account, where he went and preached immediately he was bold okay but he has a clear testimony that that's the thing is the apostle has a clear testimony and he tells it again here in Acts 26 and it starts in verse 14 this is him before Agrippa and when we're all and when we were all fallen to the earth I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue Saul Saul why perse persecutest thou me it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks and I said who art thou Lord and he said I am Jesus whom thou persecutest but rise and stand upon thy feet for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles and unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me whereupon O King Agrippa I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision so what did he do he met the condition for salvation he wasn't disobedient he obeyed it all right just like you have to obey for salvation as it says in acts 532 and we are his witnesses and so also is the holy ghost whom god hath given to them that obey him Bible said in Romans 6 17 then being then that you were the servants of sins but now ye have obeyed from the heart 
that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. The Bible said in 1 Peter chapter number 1, seeing then that you have purified your soul in obeying the truth unto unfeigned love for the brethren, see that you love one another out of a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So he had to obey. What? He obeyed the heavenly vision. He obeyed, as you saw back there in Acts 22, what Ananias told him. He arose and he called on the name of the Lord, washing away his sins. He, he believed, he repented. He obeyed. Uh, and you see him here giving that testimony again. And he says in verse 20, But showed first unto them of Damascus and Jerusalem throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So you see there he gives... Once again, his testimony, that's what we're talking about right now. There's three things. Testimony. His testimony is clear. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, and I know it, and I'm, I'm just going to go there. I've already quoted some things from 2 Corinthians 5. Talking about how Jesus died for all men. Salvation's for everybody. That's the will of God. Uh, you know. God chooses everyone. Uh, you know, he chooses everyone for salvation. The question is, what's, what's man going to do with that choice before him? The whosoever. So people will agree with whosoever or they'll agree with some of these scriptures that I just mentioned about you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine and you have purified your soul into obeying the truth and uh, you know God hath given the Holy Ghost unto all them that obey him uh, you know people will agree with that out of one side of their mouth but actually disagree with it out of the other side of their mouth they disagree with it doctrinally yet they'll say they agree with that scripture but they really don't agree with that scripture based off of how they actually believe and interpret the Bible a lot of double speak a lot of uh, double mindedness is what it is 2 Corinthians 5.17 says therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things have passed away and behold all become new this is clear all has become new. You become a new creature the moment at salvation. And so just like this testimony that Paul's giving and the test we overcome by the word of our testimony, he remembers the day, he remembers how it happened, he remembers the details of how it happened. And it's clear. He knows when the change was made. Just like I know when the change happened with me. I know right around the time it happened and I certainly know where the place that it took place at. It's very clear. Salvation is very clear. Salvation, it's not this, this whole, you know, well, I think it happened over here. It might have been right there. and I'd say you don't have it. You can't even point to where it took place. You can't even, you, you don't really know when it happened. And I'd say, you don't line up with scripture because it says all things become new. And there's a lot of people that I've talked to throughout my five years of being born again who, who they, they can't pinpoint a place of where they got actually saved. And then I've met lots of other people who know exactly when they got saved, how they got saved, 
and all of that. You know, I have to put it like this. How can you not know about the greatest day of your life? How can you not really be sure about the greatest day of your life, the greatest experience of your life? When God reached down, when you came before God with a broken spirit and a contrite heart, and you were desperate, or you came before him humbly, and you sought him and he set you free and he regenerated you and made you a new creature as it says right here and literally everything was new how can you not remember that how can you not put a put a place on that how can you not speak about that uh, without being overjoyed or, you know, what happens a lot of time when I give my salvation testimony, I start breaking down and I start crying because it was so powerful. And I say, well, I've heard a lot, well, you know, you just had a radical experience. Well, of course I did. Salvation is a radical experience. Salvation is a radical experience. Salvation is, it's, you've been made new you've been born again you, everything's new now the weight of sin and the weight uh, of bondage has been cast off of you and the power of God the grace of God has come upon you that's the greatest day of your life if if you've experienced it if you even have it and the today most people don't have it most people don't have this, this part right here that's part of common salvation. They don't have a testimony. They don't have the true grace of God wherein Peter said we stand. I'm going to read that scripture now. 1 Peter 5. They haven't been baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's one baptism, it says. One baptism, one faith. And that's why he said there to earnestly contend for it. Because there's one faith, there's one body, there's one baptism. Now, there's a lot of people out there that say they're, they've been, they've, they have been the baptized with the Holy Ghost. They say it. They say they're part of the body. They say they're part of the faith. But they miss this mark right here with a testimony. And that can't be, my, my brothers, my sisters listening, that, that cannot be. Because that's not Bible. If it's not lining up with the Bible, then let God be true and every man a liar. Because all things become new at salvation. All. All. You either believe that scripture or you don't believe that scripture. You either hold to that word of God where it says you've been cleansed from all unrighteousness, from all sin, or you don't. You either believe that you've been made free from sin or you don't believe it. And if you're reading some other Bible, it's most likely going to say that you're not free from sin. It's most likely going to say that you're not sanctified. As it said right there in Jude 1, in verse 1, to them that are sanctified, made holy, set apart for God's purpose. 1 Peter 5, in verse 12, by Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. I got to ask you a question. Do you have the true grace of God that Peter was talking about? Do you have the true grace of God that the apostle Paul was working in immediately after salvation? Do you have the boldness? 
that comes with the Holy Spirit? A lot of people want to talk about tongues and they want to talk about all these other things. But what about boldness? What about boldness? The true grace of God when we stand. Romans 6 and verse 22 says, Then being made free from sin, ye become the servant of God and your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Part of being set free from your sin, having your sins washed by the blood of Jesus, being sanctified, is holiness. And that's what the true grace of God will produce, is holiness. As it's said there, in, again, in 1 Peter chapter number 1, I believe it's verse... Uh, I think I said it's verse 3 earlier might be two it's verse two elect according to the foreknowledge of God the father through sanctification of the spirit unto obedience verse 22 first Peter 1 verse 22 again seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth your soul's been purified you've been made purified you've been given a pure heart You've been given a new heart. And the fruit of that will be holiness, a holy life. The fruit of that will be loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. A pure conscience for towards God and a, be a person who's regenerate, who is zealous of good works, zealous for the things of God, zealous for the scripture, zealous to preach the word of God, zealous to minister the gospel. That's what should be common about salvation. But that's very uncommon today in this world. What is common is all the things that you hear all the time. You're not free. You're not really free from sin. You should live holy, but you can't. Uh, you're always going to sin. You're always going to fall. You're always going to fail. Powerless grace, powerless gospel, powerless a powerless Jesus, a powerless God, who doesn't really empower you to be able to do all things through Christ who really doesn't bless you with all spiritual blessings you know there's people out there that say you gotta go get another blessing they say you gotta go get another baptism when it says there's one baptism it clearly says there's one baptism so you've either had this experience with Christ where you became a new creature. You received the power of God, which is the true grace of God. Or you have not. You're still of the world. You're still, uh, you're still a Roman 7 Christian. You're carnal, sold under sin. You haven't been regenerated. So common salvation is very uncommon today in this wicked world. Common salvation brings forth holiness and the true grace of God that teaches you to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You know, 1 John chapter number 2. And hereby we do, little children, I write these things unto you that you sin not, but if any man sin, not when, if any man sin, he an advocate for the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And hereby we do know that we know him, Jesus Christ, if we keep his commandments. He that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. 
But such as keep his word, verily is the love of God, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know we are in him. And he that saith, I abideth in him, ought himself to also walk even as he walked. Are you keeping his commandments? He says in 1 John chapter number 3, it says in verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. So what's the answer to 1 John 1, 8 to those out there who say, if you say you have no sin, you make him a liar and the truth is not in you? Well, the answer to 1 John 1, 8 to the sinner making an excuse of why they still live in their sin every day and still are still going to sin. The answer to that is whosoever committeth sins of the devil for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, 1 John 3 and verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. He that doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. And how are we to love? Love not in word and in tongue, but in deed and in truth, in action. First John 5 and verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. And whoso is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. Are you saved from sin? If you, if you have this testimony of God, if you have the true grace of God wherein the saints stand, Are you saved from your sins? Do you live these scriptures? Verse 1 John 5, 18. Whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Whosoever is begotten of God keepeth himself. The wicked one toucheth him not. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Keeping the commandments of God is not grievous. It's not hard. It's not difficult. But it is to those who don't truly have salvation. They have the grace of God that's lascivious. As it talked about there in the beginning of this video. But the true grace of God produces people that doth not commit sin. Because his seed remains in him and they cannot sin because he's born of God. The true grace of God produces saints of God that abideth in him and sin not. <laughs> because they know to do good and they do it. They do things in, by faith and in faith. They doeth righteousness. They doeth well. Talks about well doing. To them by patient continuance in well doing, seek for glory, honor, immortality, eternal life. They commit to the keeping of their souls in well doing as unto a faithful creator. That's common salvation. Common salvation today is very uncommon. 
in the United States of America where we have churches on every corner. We have everyone's a Christian. Everyone goes to church. Everyone names the name of Jesus. Everyone talks about how they're saved. They talk about how they've been baptized. Some say they've been born again. But the problem is, is they don't have a testimony. And they're not living holy. And they're not standing in the true grace of God. They have a grace of God that's been turned into lasciviousness. They have a grace of God that caters to meet their sinful behavior. And the practices of what would be called the old man, not the new man. So they don't have common salvation. Because common salvation is uncommon today in America and in amongst the religious sect of professing Christians. And what... Jude said was to earnestly contend for that faith to earnestly contend against false doctrines that say Jesus Christ didn't die for every man to contend against false converts who don't have a testimony of Jesus Christ they don't have a clear testimony of how they got saved and they don't have, and if they don't have a clear testimony of how they got saved and they're a false convert, then there's no way they're standing in the true grace of God. There's no way they're possibly standing in the true grace of God. There's no way they're possibly overcoming sin. They haven't been given a new heart. They hadn't been regenerate. And what the Bible would call them is an unregenerate bastard. That's what the Bible would call them. And that's, that's what we got going on out here today, people. Common salvation is very uncommon. But there are people out there with common salvation. It's just very uncommon. The testimony is one of the biggest things that uh, people don't have. They don't have testimony. And it's not biblical. The, what the testimony they have is not biblical. Because all things have not become new for them. They 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 uh, don't rejoice in that salvation that they have. They have nothing to shout about because they have not experienced it. It doesn't bring them to tears with joy unspeakable and full of glory what God did to them because they have not had it happen to them. And so you have to ask yourself the question, has it happened to you? Has it truly happened to you? Because you can know. These things have I written unto you that you may know that you may know you have eternal life. It says in 1 John 5 and uh, 13 there. These things have I written unto you. John 5, he says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Verse 20, 1 John 5 and verse, that's actually verse 19 and 20, and I'm going to end with this. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, 
and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true. Even in his son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. That's common salvation. God gives you an understanding. And to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. Your testimony will line up with, with Scripture. You either believe the Scripture or you don't. And the fact that old things pass away and all becomes new. Salvation is radical. Salvation is powerful. Paul wouldn't have preached about it two times. It wouldn't have been mentioned three times in Acts, and it wouldn't have been preached twice by Paul himself. And it wouldn't be mentioned in Revelation 12, 11 if it wasn't a big deal. Because that's how we overcome, by the word of our testimony. So these are things in common salvation. So when the scripture says in 1 John 4 and verse 1, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God. For many false prophets have gone out in the world. Take heed to that scripture. Try the spirits. Earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. A lot of people will read and talk about common salvation and not have salvation at all. They don't have the same salvation that the Bible talks about. See that? They, they don't have the salvation that the book talks about. And Jesus said, you try to climb up some other way, you're the same as a thief and a robber. And then just like it said there in Jude, these people turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Ungodly men. Ungodly men, he said. who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, a powerless grace, a powerless gospel, a powerless faith. Denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus. Common salvation. Do you have it? Do you line up with the scriptures? Do you line up with God's word? Do you have a testimony? Do you have the true grace of God wherein we stand? Common salvation is uncommon today in this wicked, ungodly nation. Till next time, guys, Lord bless you.